So um, welcome everybody. Um, this is the first of our new Turing Fellow introductory talks. So um, we've had a round of recruitments to the Turing Fellowships and we've got a great bunch of new fellows who've just started this month um, and uh, will be familiarizing themselves with the Turing Institute and I hope visiting London even once visiting is um, uh, allowed again. So um, first speaker today is Dr. Tingting Niu. So Tingting is a senior lecturer in machine learning in the Department of Computer Science. And she is going to talk about representation learning, fundamentals and applications. Over to you, Tingting. Ting. Okay, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Magnus, for the introduction. And uh, it's my uh, pleasure to join the Turing family and uh, to share my research with you guys today. And uh, hello, everybody. Yeah. So, uh, so first I'm going to start from a bit uh, what a representation learning is. So usually in the uh, machine learning pipeline, representation learning plays a very critical role there. So if you uh, have some objects of interest you would like to analyze, and you start from collecting, collecting information on it, which can be either in data or in knowledge format. So in the later slides, we're going to talk a bit more about the difference between data and knowledge. So in order to construct a, a model that can learn from the data and the knowledge, and the first thing you will need to do is to convert it to representations that can be used as the input of a machine learning algorithm. And it's usually, and it's almost always, the, the quality of the representations you constructed will significantly affect the performance of the machine learning model in your targeted task. Okay, yeah. So uh, the name of this area, uh, representation learning, um, I think probably becomes popular after Banjo published their review paper on representation learning uh, in TPAMI in 2013. So this is a big area covers many classical uh, research topics in machine learning field. So for example, feature extraction, dimensionality reduction, manifold learning and embedding more recently neural representation learning. So approach-wise, uh, what you can do about encoding information is you can encode it as uh, data points in a representation space, or geometric uh, shapes in a representation space, for example, hypersphere here, or probability distributions. So our research on representation uh, learning, it uh, started from uh, spectral embedding and uh, projection pursuit. And uh, later on, we moved uh, to work on co-embedding relational data and the learning binary strings to store uh, video content uh, efficiently. And we have also worked on neural network architecture design to mimic the attention and the memory mechanism to improve e image representation learning. So if you are interested in uh, this work, you're very welcome to read uh, our paper. Uh, so here is a map of my research landscape. So under the big umbrella of the algorithm and the theory development area, so we have a list of research topics that we are interested in. Uh, so the motivations that drive our research include uh, uh, reduce the use of label, improve the model transparency, and uh, to understand the better and improve improve generalization. And uh, so there are some like uh, fundamental subjects that uh, support our algorithm and the theory research. And in addition to this um, uh, algorithm and the theory development, we are also very keen on like applying our knowledge and the algorithms we developed to uh, practical, to real world applications. 
for example, to provide a practical AI solution to automate a process, process or to uh, construct a, a machine learning surrogate model to approximate some computationally extensive model, for example, some engineering model. And also we work on data analysis that uh, analyze the find the patterns from text, uh, image, and uh, speech data. So you can see in the remaining of my presentation, I'm going to talk a little bit more on these three highlighted topics and also share a bit of our new results we have found in the theory of for, for relation factorization. Okay, so about uh, data visualization. So the objective of this uh, research task is to enable the user to observe and uh, track uh, the patterns in your high dimensional data or relational data by embedding it into only a two dimensional or a three dimensional space. So the challenge of this research task is imposed by its natural setting which is the dramatically, uh, dramatic reduction of your uh, parameter freedom. So you can only use two or three coordinates to characterize each data point. So because of this, the information loss is just uh, unav unavoidable. So when you cannot preserve all the information contained by your data, so you have to make a choice. So the question is, what patterns or data structures you will need to preserve and also how to utilize the Euclidean ge geometry in the representation space to communicate the selected uh, data patterns and the structures. So a common approach in this uh, uh, field is to preserve local neighbor. So as shown in this single example, if you have a neighbor, you have your identified uh, ABC as X for your nearest neighbor. And then in the new space, you would like to have ABC again to be your nearest neighbor. Okay, so this is a basic idea of local neighbor representation. But this approach is, uh, can be pro problematic. It can lead to misleading visualization results due to a local vs global issue. So what we meant here is when you have an algorithm that, that can pre preserve pretty well your local neighbor structure, it is unnecessary. Uh, it can lead a, a truthful description of your global data structure. So we reported this issue in a paper we published in TPME in 2017. So we use a three-dimensional Swiss raw data here. And uh, you can see for the two algorithm that is the uh, second and the third column of the top figure. So you see the algorithm can preserve pretty well the neighbor preservation score, but it has a pretty arbitrary global data structure. And then the algorithm in the right column, you can see it preserves pretty well the global structure, but Unfortunately, its uh, local neighbor preservation score is not uh, very satisfactory. And then this uh, same issue uh, was also reported by another paper two years later, uh, published in Nature Biotechnology. So they use the uh, circular data as an example. So you can see the four figures on the right next to the circular data. So they, share, they have very different uh, global data structure due to different settings they use uh, for, for different algorithms. So how do, we, uh, how do we fix this uh, problem? So uh, we proposed a strategy to preserve, like uh, to improve the local and the global data structure preservation by simultaneously preserve the neighboring relationship, not only between data cohorts, but also between individual data points. So the idea here is very simple. Uh, so you have a point X, you have ABC as its neighbor, and then you have the, this data cohort one, and then you have data cohort two, three, four as its neighboring cohort. So you want to preserve this neighboring relationship between points and between cohorts in the new space. 
Okay, so the idea is straightforward, but then in reality, when you are handling high dimensional data and also with data with fairly poor cohort separation, so to reach a good preservation accuracy is challenging. So there is a trade-off between the local preservation accuracy and the global preservation accuracy. And also many algorithms uh, that, that is based on quite, uh, how to say, elaborate optimization process that can affect uh, computing speed. So whatever algorithm development goal is to improve the accuracy and also to speed up the calculation. So currently we are working on a visualization tool, which will include a website, a tutorial website, and also a visualization library to share our developed algorithm with the users. Okay, so the next day is about hybrid learning uh, from data and knowledge. So it's another topic we're interested in. Um, so I'm going to start from like explaining a bit on what's the difference between data and knowledge by using a bird image classification example. So here you can see in this task, what the model is expected to do is when you have a input image and then the model is supposed to tell you, okay, what is the bird type this image shows. So in this top right image, you can see it's a, American crop, that's the bird type. So in order for the model to learn how to do that, you can feed the model data. So you feed the model data, that is the example images of American crop. And then you can also feed the model knowledge. So that means that that refers to what you have already know about how this American crop looks. So it, uh, for example, it can be, so American crow is a subclass of bird. It has a black wing and also has a solid pattern. So the benefit and the motivation doing for us to do this is uh, first, we would like to reduce the use of label. And the second, when we do annotation, it's, of, it, it's quite often you will encounter mistakes in your label. So we would like to reduce the negative effect of mistakes in our label. And also another important motivation is we would like to uh, improve our model's explain explainability. So by establishing a map mapping between your data and the knowledge, so some selected knowledge will serve as the evidence of your data-driven black box model. So to do this, our main strategy is uh, we are going to learn representation space and merge and map information there. So we demonstrate two example tasks here uh, to show how we use uh, external knowledge to improve the data-driven model. So the first task is to recognize uh, human object interaction from images. So as you can see on the right image on the top, you see a human there, and the object interaction pair with will be uh, the cat, cat, uh, hug a cat. So this human is hugging this cat. Um, so we work under the zero shot learning setup. So this setup means when you recognize this interaction, you didn't, uh, when you train your model, you didn't feed the model any label information regarding to that uh, interaction. So two. To achieve this, so we, we construct constraints over the object and action pairs, use it as our knowledge, so we call it affordance group graph. So that, for example, say if you focus on the action hold, so you can only hold a dog and uh, you can hold a dog, a cat and a ball. But then if you fo focus on the action, for example, hug, you can only hug a dog and a cat but not really a ball. So these are the information we inject to the model and it can greatly uh, improve the zero shot learning performance. And then the second task is the bird image classification task, which is the same one as we mentioned earlier. So what we work, what the setup we work on, work under is uh, few shot learning. So we feed the model only one up to five uh, example images for a bird type. 
So what we did is we developed uh, with our collaborator a bird ontology and extracted axioms from the ontology to describe different bird concepts. And then again, it improves the performance and also it managed to produce some more semantically meaningful error. So that means when the uh, model makes a mistake, it's a better mistake. Yeah. So in this, uh, okay, next example is, uh, here is uh, uh, the motivation I show this example here is, uh, I would like to share with you uh, about some uh, thinking process when we apply our knowledge or technique to uh, solve a real world problem. So this is a KTP project we work with a company. And then this company is from its own telephone call business. So they are interested in detecting vulnerability patterns from their telephone call data and by jointly analyzing the audio signals and uh, test transcripts. So in this project, the, the biggest challenge we have encountered is we don't have data. We don't have labeled data. So and there is no example data in this in their business contact um, describing vulnerability pattern can be released uh, to us. So what we have to do is we have to analyze the business needs and uh, also their customer needs and also regulatory documents to manually formulate a vulnerability definition. And based on it, we collect the information, which includes a partially or indirectly related data and the knowledge resource. And then based on that, we, we formulate a combined set of machine learning, speech recognition, and the natural language processing tasks. And then when we develop a solution, we address two things. One is the decision making, making, and the other is the evidence extraction, because it's important for a business product that can make a decision, but meanwhile, it needs to flag to their customer why, why they make the decision. Okay, so the, uh, the last example I would like to share with you is uh, some of our results from our theoretical understanding on relation factorization. So uh, we focus on, we're interested in uh, uh, an important uh, uh, representation learning family for relation data. So the, the, the way this uh, uh, family work is based on three way factor, a uh, matrix factorization. So basically you are given a relation matrix here and then you decompose it into the product of three matrices, ASB here. And then we call these three matrices A, S and B as representations of the relation matrix. So the uh, why this algorithm operation is useful. So first, uh, in reality, when you have relation matrix, you will not observe all the entries in R. You will have some missing entry there. And then this operation can help you to infer the missing entry. And also, so when your re relation matrix is uh, of low rank, so you can understand it as uh, some data with uh, uh, less number of freedom. So you don't, but uh, but a very large like relation matrix. So you don't need to store this data by storing every entry. So you only store the information by using ASB. And then when you have a small K, so the consumed the memory space will be much reduced. And another benefit you have is you can analyze the patterns in your row and the column objects by analyzing your matrix A and B. So this is about the algorithm. So what we are interested in here is we want to establish some theoretical understanding of this family of algorithm. So we ask the question, so when you have this relation matrix, generated by this ASB generative model. And then when you observed a set of entries, and then we ask, what patterns can you really recover from the matrix A and the matrix B? 
And so we, we have recently approved something new, which is not published yet, but I'm very excited to share you a flavor of this theorem. So we, we, we discovered that if you impose uh, certain conditions on this generative model, uh, which is not that difficult to, to be satisfied in reality. And then there exists an algorithm that can recover the positions of the non-zero elements in A and B with a probability at least P. And then this probability P, you can calculate it. So the, the, use, uh, the usefulness of this uh, uh, theorem comes from, it can help you understand the role of sparsity in this three-way relation factorization model. Okay, so um, in, in the end, I would like to end this presentation by welcoming uh, new collaborations. So as I mentioned here, um, these are the topics we're interested in. So far, when we develop algorithms and the techniques uh, around these topics, we're looking at uh, general algorithm design. But then to expand it, we're really, really welcome to, um, to use the algorithm or develop algorithm for some domain-specific high-impact application so that we look at more domain-specific application driven algorithm design. And also another thing is, when you improve the explainability of a model, it's quite a challenging. All we can say, it's probably ineffective to do it in a general sense. So it's not that you have fixed a way to fix the way to explain things for many different tasks. So we would like to work on more task-oriented explainability. And also we would like to investigate a bit more, research more on the role of human in a learning pipeline. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. I I finished that presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Ting Ting. Uh, um, I hope I am on time. Sorry about the mess in the beginning. Thanks so much. Um, okay. So uh, questions. Um, you can either put them in the chat or you can just um, unmute yourself and say something. Either way. And while while we're waiting, I've got a couple of questions actually, Ting Ting. I, I was very interesting about the uh, TSNI, um, you know, and the other nonlinear. Yeah, I say. This is, this, is, yeah. this, is, this is like a really hot topic in computational biology, but it looks like your work preceded uh, this, this paper. But you might have seen recently there's been uh, lots of debate about this with Leo Pachter bringing out, uh, having a paper out recently on this topic. Mm -hmm. It's really caused a lot of controversy. So you're, you've got a kind of workaround for this and your workaround is to model both the local and the global, global distances. Yeah. And yeah. Is, is cohorts, is that like a cluster or what's a cohort? Yes, you're right. So cohort here is a mainly cluster structure. Okay. Yeah, so that's our current focus. But then uh, you can expand on this, say, even including some topological structure, because the real global structure defining geometry is actually based on topological. So as this cohort, they are only like a disk connected component. And then you can also discover the holes in the data, higher dimensional holes. So okay. more topological characteristic may be able to like a communicated uh, in a low dimensional space. Yeah. So do you know under what circumstances there is a representation in a low dimensional space? So could it be that the structures, the global structures just don't have a good two dimensional representation? Because I suppose locally, you usually think that the manifold might have some sort of low dimensional structure. Yeah. But globally, perhaps not. Yeah, mm, perhaps not. So, yeah, I, I think uh, theoretically, in that sense, that is, if we assume the data points uh, distribute uh, on a manifold, then what is the true dimensionality of any of that manifold? That that matters. 
So if that the manifold has a slightly higher, quite a high dimension, and then theoretically that has been proved, you can embed it to a different uh, space with uh, even higher dimension, like a Whitney embedding theory. Um, so, mm. so basically it could be in reality, perhaps you will never find a, a two or three d <laughs> dimensional space that can perfectly preserve your local and the global structure. Unless your original manifold dimensionality is really, really low, like a one dimension or two dimension at a four, at two or three, one, two, three dimension. Have you tried yeah. your methods on any of these single cell biological data sets? Yeah, actually we're working on that. So we are running experiments on trying on those data. So so it's uh, the popular method for that is the UMAP. Yeah. It, 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 everybody is using it. Yeah. And then we, we we're trying to like uh, you apply our algorithm to the similar data they, they used. And then on a large scale to see how the performance is. And we're working on that. It takes time. If you want some Manchester data, then uh, my group and the core facility in, in biology, we're running these single cell experiments. Ah, really? So uh, if you want to try some data that's actually live, then, um, then get in touch. Um, I've got another question because this week there's been a lot of attention about um, some problems in Google Summarize natural language, uh, which stems from the difficulty of dealing with negative information in representations. And it's known from a while ago that BERT can have like a 100% error rate on, mm -hmm. uh, on, negative com on completion of negative statements. So for instance, using the concept that a robin is not a crow seems mm. to be really difficult. So mm. I was wondering if you have any ideas about representations that incorporate knowledge about negative relationships. Is that just mm. a really difficult problem or do you think there are any ways of getting around that? Well, we, okay, so in our sense, so in our work here, I guess the non-negative relationship here we touched is, uh, so when one concept is uh, not related to the other concept. So this is really what we tried in this sense. And then what we did for that is we, we just, uh, we, we model hyper, hyperspheres and dimensional balls for them. And so we would like to push them away so they, they shouldn't uh, intersect. But then so so it's mainly so if you want to address negative relations so it's most likely you, you have to formulate it in your loss function so mm. if you, you use machine learning based approach um so if you don't directly formulate it in your loss function well I, I found it really really hard for the model to learn it itself by feeding it maybe like uh, partially related uh, information or something can lead uh, to this negative relation, but without uh, telling the model, uh, this leads to this negative relation. I found it re really challenging for the model to learn itself. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. oh, uh, we got a question. So, uh, ah, uh, someone's asking about whether the slides are available. Now we've recorded the talk. Um, but we can also, I guess, make the talk available, Ting Ting? Yeah. Or, or yeah. do you put talks on your website or anything? Uh, yeah, oh, I can send you the, my, my file, yeah. Okay. I, I, I will send you my file and uh, then maybe we can host it uh, somewhere, yeah. Okay, we can, we can maybe put it where we put the videos. Or yeah, yeah. yeah. We'll, yeah. We'll, put them, we'll put them on the Edzai website with the, with the YouTube link. Great. Thanks a lot, Matthew. Okay, Ting Ting, thank you for that. Um, that's great. And great, thank you. Our next talk is from uh, Marco Vigo, um, who's a lecturer in health informatics. And Marco, do you want to share your slides? Great. And Marco is going to talk about methods, tools, and case studies for user interaction modeling. Over to you, Marco. Yep. Um, all right. You can hear me well, right? And you can see the slides. 
Yeah, perfect. Yeah, perfect. Right. Uh, thanks, Magnus, for the introduction, and thanks to the Turing Institute for giving me the opportunity to uh, to share my my work. Right. So, right. Um, yeah. So, my interest. I'm interested in understanding how users behave uh, and how users use data intensive systems. So, for me, a data intensive system is something that gets very close. To, to data, not raw data, but could be something like an information dashboard or um, um, health self-tracking ecosystem where you have the wearable, you have an app, you have a dashboard on, 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 on a laptop, right? So very close interactions with, with data. And I want to understand how people interact with this, with this data. And, and to do so, um, the goal of, of my work, more than focusing on those, on those, on those, um, on those preferences is to build tools and build systems to, to try to acquire this understanding, right? So I want to extract objective and actionable understanding. And when I mean objective, I want is that I want the understanding to be, I want the data, the interaction data to tell me what's going on, as opposed to people self-reporting about what's going on and actionable, right? I want that the, the, the knowledge acquisition I do to be actionable so I can use it and I can use this uh, this knowledge so I can inform the design of user interfaces, identify issues with the user interface and address them by fixing them. Also inform them the design of digital health interventions. So sometimes you have a digital health intervention, um, an app for let's say manage diabetes. And probably the science behind managing diabetes is correct, but the wrapper, the container, the user interface around that intervention, it's rubbish, right? And the intervention doesn't work because the wrapper is not good enough, right? So I want to capture this kind of problems in real time so that I can do something uh, later on. And I can also inform the design of workflows and data governance uh, policies as well. But for this to happen, I, I also design pipelines that collect, store, transform, query, and analyze human-computer interactions. Um, so if I want to acquire this understanding, I need to do all this, okay? So that towards the end, I just build computational user models that allow me to predict whether people are interested in using systems, where people are engaged with in, uh, these systems as well, whether there's interaction barriers or whether people are learning as they interact with the systems, okay? So this picture at the bottom right, I mean, this is like the typical digital phenotyping picture you see. <laughs> everywhere, right? But my, my, my focus is in a human-computer interaction, okay? I don't specialize in sensor-driven data. So let me set the scope of the work, okay? I focus on low granularity interaction data, and we can define this by comparing it with the other types of data, interaction data. So you see this stack here on the left-hand side. At the bottom, we have the low granularity data. At the top, we have uh, the high granular data. The high granular data is related to a goal or a problem. It's highly descriptive, okay? It tells you a lot of information. And the low granularity data uh, is, is it, it's, it's not descriptive at all. It's very specific and it lacks context, context, okay? Here at the top of the stack, you have indicators of explicit behavior. So someone is searching for a patient on a form, right? On a search engine while Low granularity data contains implicit behavioral markers, okay? Things that people do unconsciously, but are there in the human cognition, right? So I'm interested in this bottom part of the stack. Um, this is basically because, you know, this, it contains, this, this kind of data contains uh, behavioral markers that are indicators of cognitive processes. So for instance, the location of the mouse cursor can tell me where people are looking at and I can, I can infer the attention of users on the specific parts of, of, of the screen. Um, exploratory type of behaviors are indicators of whether people are engaged or not with um, an interactive systems. If I can observe someone scrolling down quickly, this may suggest that they are suffering from information overload, okay? And collecting this kind of events is easier compared to those at the top of the stack, right? So those at the top of the stack require you to typically instrument a software system, uh, annotate it everywhere, while those at the bottom are kind of affordable to collect, although they have 
some challenges and caveats. And my goal uh, in my research is to try to address all these challenges and make it this easy. And this kind of data collection is very useful for into the wide naturalistic studies, right? Where people are using a system for a long time, they might lose the awareness that they are taking part in a study as well. So it has high ecological validity. It's easy to recruit a lot of participants, although there's also some weaknesses that you cannot control for the tasks and it's difficult to collect uh, objective ground truth about the experiment or study you are conducting, okay? So the challenges I mentioned earlier, um, there's a very limited semantics associated with this kind of data, right? If you have a sequence of um, scrolls or um, key typing events, it means very little, right? Unless you do something about it. Um, you generate a lot of noisy outputs, okay? If, if you scroll down with your mouse, it may generate like hundreds or thousands of a scroll events that may uh, constrain or determine a lot and the analysis process later on. If you are following like a frequentist approach and you're trying to identify the most frequent patterns, um, sc scroll event may determine um, all the results, right? So you, do, 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 you need to do something about it if you want to, to just, so that the most interesting behaviors emerge to the surface. It's very difficult to, formulate hypothesis. So you have some expectations about the system you have designed and you want to see whether people are using it according to the expectations. It's very little you can do about it, right? And it's difficultly scalable because this low granularity event, I mean, you can generate millions and millions of, of data points. So in order to address these, these challenges, we developed um, a tool called WebQuery. Um, and um, let me do some shameless promotion. We got the best people award at the EICS conference in 2017, and a lot of work has been derived from this preliminary um, piece of work, okay? And what I'm going to present right now uh, is something that targets people who may not be data scientists or may not be data savvy people, right? It's people targeting, it's, it's work targeting people at organizations uh, that have access to data, but they don't have the, the the, the skills to analyze the data, okay? This could be like user researchers, this could be information officers at the NHS, for, for instance, okay? That's happened to me, that people have access to data, but they don't know how to, what to do with that data because they don't have the skills. You could say they could hire a data scientist, but they don't, okay? So this this kind, this kind this tool aims at addressing these challenges and, and while it is useful for all the populations, it's, it's, it's more beneficial to those who are not data savvy and makes data science more democratic, I would say. So the first problem was about limited semantics. There's very little knowledge in its data point, right? So we um, address this problem by including the interaction context at collection time. So here we have the participants of um, an experiment or a study who interact with their machines, who are connected to a web server, and we are uh, extracting the data from their interactions, right? So this is how an event would look like. So typically, while you would have an IP and the event, so in this case, it's a most moved event, we collect also the coordinates of the event, the location on a website where this event happens, and so on and so on. So there's lots of contextual information you can extract, which at the same time makes the data analysis a bit more difficult, but you can also um, have views on this data. So you can treat this, 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 this data point as a triple, right? Of um, a timestamp, an event, and the location of the event on the screen. The second problem about having like uh, noisy outputs and high cardinality, a lot of unique events, um, is addressed by giving tools for transforming, subsetting, and filtering the events. Okay, so here we have a user interface where users can select, not user, but user researchers can select from, from their data set the events in which they are interested in, and they can combine them. Uh, they can tell, I want only those events, like most down and most up, uh, that are triggered, triggered by a particular user interface event, okay? You can combine them, so you drag and drop here and you create a customized event, an event sequence, let's call it. So for instance, I'm now creating a customized event here, which is about loading the window screen, um, the browser window, um, having like two most wheel events and then having a click on a button, right? And I can also establish uh, time constraints. So this should only happen uh, in a time frame of 12 seconds. So extract all the events that meet these requirements. 
this is something you could do. You could subset, filter, and transform. So that later on, all these customized events that you, you have a catalog of customized events here, okay? Um, and then what you can do is to visualize whether this event occur or not. So we call it hypothesis formulation, but basically what you are doing is here, here is you're trying to see whether the expectations of use are, are being met, okay? And you have a catalog of, of, of customized sequences of events. And then what you can do is to take, make a selection of this customized event and put it through a pipeline of um, sequential pattern mining algorithms so the output of these algorithms would be, you know, those algor uh, those sequences of events that are most frequent. Okay, and we also address the scalability problem because now running these these, these, these queries and running these these algorithms is computationally demanding. So if we incorporate here a MapReduce query engine, you could uh, run this kind of queries on millions of data points on a just consumer um, laptop. Okay. And what you see here on the screen is the most frequent events, uh, sequences of events uh, of, of, a of a query, okay? That's an example of that. Now, I could speak about this for, for ages, but I think it's more appropriate that if you are interested in it, you watch a video I put in here. Uh, the, the source code is available on GitHub as well if you want to extend and use a uh, web query. Uh, and we tested um, the, the system with, uh, we evaluated the system with people who were not scientists, people who were user researchers. And the user study suggested that indeed by using this kind of tools, um, user researchers are able to extract more meaningful understanding from user interactions, and they can use this for, for different purposes, as I mentioned before. Okay, so we have the tools. Now I move into, into the methods, okay? Um, so here's a pipeline, very similar to the ones before. We have lots of users using interactive systems that they generate interaction logs, and we have the, the pipeline I mentioned before. So we have um, functionalities for filtering, transforming, hypothesis testing. You might use web query, but you may not if you're a data scientist and you're happy with uh, your Python scripts or R and so on, okay? And what I want to do is because I said at the, at the beginning, um, there's this, this latent, um, these latent behaviors are, are indicators of some other phenomena going on, right? With the person using the system and with the system as well. So I want to use um, these behaviors or these patterns of use as, as, as features of user models, okay? So I want to have generate a vector of features that derives from interaction data. And by using this, this pipeline with a tool or without a tool support, uh, you can do this um, in an hypothesis driven fashion, okay? You may already know which kind of features you're looking for, okay? You know, I want this feature, I want this feature, I want this feature, and you are very selective here at every stage, okay? And then you have like a very clean data set that you can analyze. Or it can be data driven. Probably you have a very vague idea about that data, or you have no idea, and you're very lenient here at, at, at the pipeline, okay? And you allow all the events to go forward, and then you apply sequential pattern mining, and you know the output of this sequential pattern mining will give you like the top uh, most frequent behaviors that you can use as as features, okay? And and therefore you would have um, a computational representation of of users over time because data is associated with timestamps, and and therefore um, you can segment users by um, sessions or by periods of time. Therefore, if you are running like a longitudinal study of one year, you could create buckets of features, okay? So here you have each column would be um, a profile of a user at a determined session, okay? Um, and therefore, this computational representation, the matrix here, it would be like a fingerprint for a human computer interaction of a determined user with a particular system, okay? And then you can fit um, this, this, this matrix to machine learning algorithms that, you know, if you know the class, you can apply supervised learning. If you don't know it, you can do supervised learning. I learned about it. Now, but there's even further challenges if you adopt the data-driven fashion approach, right? If you are like more exploratory and just trying to see what kind of features might be in the data. So maybe problems. And the problem is that the noisy output problem that we mentioned before, it's not gone, right? Because now you have pattern overload. So sequential pattern mining algorithms generate like 
hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of 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 patterns, especially when you have big data sets. Um, basically, because some patterns become are patterns of other patterns, right? And very minor variations of patterns also are understood as unique patterns. Now, I I know that there's some sequential pattern mining algorithms that allow you to control these these problems, but it's it's not 100% uh, sure that you are not going to have noisy outputs, okay? And and also again, we still have some problem with the limited expressivity problem, right? We still have sequences of events with, associated with with a timestamp happening in particular locations of the user interface. If you don't have a domain expert involved, it's very difficult to interpret the patterns, right? So you need someone there to try to understand what's going on. So two-step method here that involves humans in the loop on, in the pipeline, in the pipeline, in between the generation of patterns and in the generation of, of the features of the models. So we do further filtering by using this criterion. We want to maximize expressivity while reducing idiosyncrasy, meaning we want longer patterns, which means that you know the more long the pattern is, the more expressive or the more semantic knowledge it may contain. Okay. And we want long and frequent patterns. Unfortunately, the most frequent patterns are the short ones to, you know, due to probabilistic reasons. Therefore, you have to strike a balance here to make a choice about of, of, of the patterns you want. And then you can do further grouping by doing, we said, why don't we do some kind of thematic analysis of patterns? You know, this is something that you do typically on qualitative research uh, with text or multi multimedia material. Why don't we give these patterns to user researchers and why don't they let them group them, right? Why don't they group the, the patterns and they come up with um, themes from these patterns and these themes would become um, the features, okay? So let's have some coders in between that would analyze the patterns and tell us what the themes are and the themes become um, the patterns. So what we're doing here, basically, if you remember the stack I mentioned before, where you have like a very low abstraction at the bottom and a more abstraction towards the top, very specific at the bottom and very descriptive at the top, is that we are moving upwards, okay, on, on, on the stack by involving um, humans here. And this is about the pipelines and, and, and methods, okay? Now some case studies in which we use these tools and these pipelines and oftentimes related to my research interest of human data interaction. So the first one is a medication safety dashboard. You see that it's like a very data intensive uh, artifact where uh, data, you can see data in a tabular fashion. And we just wanted to characterize the use of its users, okay? We had two types of users. We had clinical pharmacists and we had the secondary users of the tool, which were GPs or nurses and so on in the, in the, in the, in the general practice. So we wanted to know whether there were uh, behaviors that were characteristics character, characteristic of, of, of the users, right? Uh, we generated some hypothesis-driven features. Uh, we applied supervised learning where the class was the type of user, okay? And we involved 35 people during a period of thir for 10 months, right? And, and indeed, we found that um, uh, primary users have a characteristic behavior of being quicker, spending less time on websites, and having a behavior which was of uh, of an expir less exploratory, okay? While the secondary users, those who were not clinical pharmacists and those that, you know, the, the, the intervention didn't target, they were like more of um, the behaviors are very, were more exploratory, they were slower, and they used to dwell on, on, on pages that were targeting uh, the other users, okay? So yes, we could detect who was using um, the, the, the tool almost in real time, okay? And this allows for interventions, okay? Because if you know the kind of user that is, is using the uh, your tool, you could make adjustments based on their profiles. Um, another interesting problem that we have tackled recently is about um, modeling or yes, modeling um, behavior evolution over time, okay? Over long periods of, of time. Um, so the goal was to monitor here research, sorry, monitor search and exploratory behaviors in a longitudinal, longitudinal fashion on a search engine, okay? So we just developed a new search engine and we wanted to see how people who are new to this software would behave over time, okay? And how their behaviors would characterize their, their groups and, and their behaviors. And we can use some hypothesis-driven features 
derived from the knowledge acquisition, learning, and domain expertise literature. And we applied some unsupervised learning to see how the different cohorts uh, behaved. Okay, so we involved 239 users over 20 months. Um, one of the highlights about this work was that uh, initially you have an heterogeneous pool of users who have very different behaviors. But over time, you see like a convergence, okay? Their, their behavior tends to converge. While you can see that there's, you know, you can also capture the changes of, of individuals in between clusters. You see how there's like a ten, tendency towards belonging to the, to the bigger cluster, okay? And that's because the behavior becomes more homogeneous. Another case study is, or the following two case studies are on online learning, okay? And online learning has been like a field of, of a study that has, that, you know, has received a lot of attention in the last five years, especially in the last two years, right? And there's a lot of work done here. But here, typically the data, the, the data granularity involved in this kind of um, studies is um, clickstream data, okay? Which is just sequences of URLs. And in addition to, um, modeling user behavior, we wanted to see how, what was the added value of low level events compared to a high level ones like clickstream data, okay? Now, we, in this one, um, we observed and we identified the engagement patterns of researchers on a connectivist MOOC over four weeks. We had 12, 224 uh, participants and on a data-driven fashion, as we mentioned before, we, we got 130 activity patterns. Uh, which are uh, the rows of this um, dendrogram and, uh, and the columns are all the users we had, okay? So um, by applying unsupervised learning techniques like um, hierarchical clustering and so on, uh, we found that by using this low level approach, you don't, we don't only confirm with, with what the literature says about how people engage with MOOCs, so the literature says that there's like three types of users, so those that complete, right? Those that engage from the beginning to the end and they complete the course. Those that are stronger starters, okay? And um, their behavior or the, their, their engagement declines over time until just they, 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 they drop and those who don't engage whatsoever, okay? But by using our approach, we were able to find um, more subtleties in the data. So we were not only able to understand what people do or what people, how people navigate between resources, but what people do within these resources, okay? What people do on the learning resources in the forum, on the wiki, and so on and so on. And we were able to find a type of um, a strong starter that disengage over time, but at the same time, it also completes the course, okay? So it disengages less than the profile that was known until now. Um, and the final case study was about, can we do the same with, can we, can, can we predict whether someone is going to be a high achiever in online learning, um, where achievement is measured by some badges given by a course instructor. Um, so we derived some data driven features, 23 of them. We applied supervised learning here and we involved 193 students over a period of four weeks. And at the same time, we, we, we tried to compare what's the added value of these low level um, patterns against, against the ones that are known, right? And are, are, are of a higher level. And what we found that was that, you know, by, by, by using this low level approach, we could increase a 7% in the accuracy of, uh, in detecting whether a student were not going to achieve a batch in, in the course, okay? And this comes back again to the point I made, made earlier about making it actionable now. So we know now which are the behaviors which are indicators of not achieving a badge. So if we are able to capture these behaviors early on in the process, we can do intervention. So we can ping this user and tell them, look, uh, you may not complete the course. Is there anything we can do for you? Okay, so that's what I mean, what I mean um, actionable. So the concluding slide. Um, I'll try to summarize the whole, the three blocks of the presentation. Um, so I think I convinced you uh, about, you know, the, the, that the low level interactions are very useful and contain uh, implicit cognitive markers that provide um, an added value, okay? To understand uh, low level interaction and to extract meaningful knowledge that can be actionable and used later on, okay? Now, I think it also comes across that, um, that doing so has a cost, right? So it has a computational cost, has 
the cost of involving um, um, humans in the process. But you can also mitigate these problems by providing full support, okay? Which is doesn't address all the problems, but um, you know it does. It has a big coverage of of, of, of existing um, challenges, and this is especially beneficial for those who are not data scientists, okay? And makes data science democratic for everyone and open. And the problems that remain are the opportunities that I have or you have. Uh, to to explore this problem space and probably um, intervene in those pipelines and have um, um, tools for interactive exploration of the problem space. Okay, and um, yeah, I'm happy to take any question right now. Thank you, Markel. Uh, give you a virtual virtual clapping. Um, so, uh, any questions? Uh, you can either just unmute and talk or you can uh, put something into the chat. Um, can I ask a question? Yeah, go for it. Hi, Mark, I enjoyed that. Uh, now, obviously you are basing yourselves on, on mouse movement, but uh, that's only part of the story. Uh, so how does your research relate to people that are using eye tracking uh, to get an in-depth view of, of how user interfaces are used? So, I mean, we, we use we have used eye tracker in, in the lab and it's something that belongs to the lab typically, right? So what we tried to do in the past was how can we approximate um, attention, right? And we did some studies by comparing eye tracking data um, against mouse behavior. And this is not a research of myself, but it's well known that you can approximate um, eye tracking data through mouse movement. Um, so, the point here is um, you can you can do it and you can do it in an affordable way. I'm sure that you lose precision, but it's doable, okay? And if you do run this remotely. If I was in the lab and I had the eye tracker, I would use it. But if not, you can try to approximate it. Oh, yeah, although, you, for instance, your safety dashboard showed a, a lot of occupancy at the top rows, which is where you click. But, but no occupancy at all at, at any of the bottom rows, which is where you look, I guess. Yeah, I mean, that that um, that uh, heat map belonged to another study, belonged to a lab study where we were trying to capture where people were looking at. So we were collecting the objective measurements. I mean, we tried to correlate these objective measurements with interaction data, right? And yeah, and you see that, we call that the paint dropping um, um, strategy where people fixate a lot on the top part of the of the tables. And there was a reason for that. And that was because if you, if you click the header, that would rank or that would sort uh, the data underneath. So there was a lot of interactions with that. And interactions means fixations as well. Thank you. Any more questions for Marco? So I, I, I've got a question. Um, so, you're getting all this rich data about how the user is interacting with the interface, be it a web page or an app or whatever. To what extent can you then have adaptive interfaces that use the data from users to improve engagement? So you mentioned that this can give you hints of how to, you know, you can flag things to the user explicitly, but can you also adaptively design the interface to improve engagement based on this kind of data that's coming in? Yes, in theory and in principle, you could do so. And if you read all the papers belonging to this family of research, they all end up saying, oh, this allows for interventions and automatic adaptations. But you know what? Nobody does adaptations. <laughs> and that's because it's, it is extremely difficult to do first and second, because by doing adaptations, you may intervene in the interface in the way that wasn't expected, and you have to make people learn the new feature that wasn't demanded, right? So you have to do it in a very careful way. And I guess you end up with a product that you can't debug. <laughs> if, you, if you have something very adaptive, it becomes impossible to kind of deal with from an engineering standpoint. Yes, but there is a compromise solution. So it doesn't have to be fully responsive or fully adapt adaptive. You can't have um, a new release of the mm -hmm. tool, right? That mm -hmm. um, caters for everyone as well. Okay. And has minimal adaptations. In terms of the education 
side. Um, how widespread is the collection of data about engagement and is it actually used in, um, you mentioned it could be used to predict how people are going to do, but is anyone actually using it as a, as a measure in there? Um, well, we are using it in the university. There's a system for monitoring engagement of students, as far as I know, uh, and we are starting this year. Um, but Blackboard and Moodle and these platforms, they all allow for data collection. But the problem with these platforms is that the granularity of the data is very high, right? So again, you have clickstream data. You know to which resources students are going, but you don't know what's going on in those in those um, in those resources. So that's where our work, you know, hits. You know, we are addressing the demands of of uh, education researchers to provide them with low level interaction data and do something about it. So data is being collected. I'm not sure if anything meaningful is being done with that data yet. I, I, I mean, I love the focus on providing tools that you're doing and just the, uh, as you say, democratizing the access to the data for people is amazing. And I'm sure we'll have much more impact than just a specific study on a specific, you know, application. So it's great, this infrastructure that you're building. I'm a, a huge yeah. fan of people doing this kind of thing. Uh, it's great. Thank you. Um, so, uh, okay, I don't think we have any more questions and I think we've run out of time. So thanks so much to Markel and Ting Ting. And um, I, I think uh, on the ITSI website, you'll see the schedule for the, the rest of these. They're a bit kind of broken up because we've got some chewing sandpits happening in the next uh, few kind of couple of months. So these talks are kind of in between. So it's a bit hard to predict when they are. You have to look on the website and see, but I uh, hope to see lots of people there. It's a good audience today and I hope there's a good audience uh, for the next ones. And thank you to the speakers and bye-bye and see you everyone. Thank you for having us. Thank you. Bye. Bye.